It's now my great pleasure to welcome the cast of the film Looper. Argo, Spring Breakers, Cloud Atlas, Hotel Transylvania, Silver Linings Playbook. It just feels like a real film festival for the community. It's very exciting for me to be here to support a film. I wanted to show Toronto the way I experience it. We want people to like our movies and understand them. What makes it really special for me is the fact that the audiences have responded the way they have. If I got lucky in the first two, this was the lottery. I feel like I hit the jackpot. I mean, I can't believe that I'm sitting at a table, you know, flanked by these people. Every producer I've ever worked with is in that guy. And a couple, I, a couple I invented. You have to be faithful to what they really were. But I certainly wouldn't, you know, deign to think that we are godfathering anything. I do. And that's why he's got the beard. The most nice thing the press have ever done. <laughs> I was really happy to find out this is where we were coming. I said, I'm in. The festival of the people who live here. That was amazing. Our moderator for this session is Henri Behar, and it is now my pleasure to welcome Patty Lomax, the director, producers, screenwriter, and cast of The Railway Man. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome to the press conference for Railway Man. Uh, most of you here in, uh, in the audience know about the film since you saw it. Uh, but for the benefit of those who are watching us on their various screens, since this press conference is streamed live, um, the film goes back and forth between Scotland in the recent past and the Far East in 1942 during the Second World War. The main character is a gentleman named uh, Eric Lomax, played by Mr. Colin Firth, who is with us today. A man in love with, fascinated by, obsessed by trains, but also traumatized by his experiences during the Second World War when he was working as a prisoner of war on what is known as the Thai Burma Death Railway. Uh, at which point he's played by Mr. Jeremy Irvine. The trauma is such that he never tells, can't bring himself to tell his wife, Patty, played by Nicole Kidman, until a certain event uh, makes the dam burst and leads him to go back to Southeast Asia and come face to face, I did not say confrontation, uh, with the man who, over the years, tortured him relentlessly during the war. And that man is played by Mr. Tenon Ishida. Now, with us today also, beside, beside the actors, are the gentleman who, one of the gentlemen who wrote the script, Mr. Frank Cottrell Boyce. Sitting next to me, the director of the film, Jonathan Triplitsky. Uh, we also have an exceptional guest today, um, and it's quite an honor to have you with us, ma'am, Miss Patty Lomax. And I will direct the first question to you, Miss Lomax. Uh, how did you feel when your husband told you that he was going to write a book about it after so many years of silence? And how did you feel when you were approached to allow the book to be turned into a film? Well, may I go back a little bit on Definitely, ma'am. Um, eventually, Eric were, was willing and able to go and receive help from the Medical Foundation for the Care of Victims of Torture, which was a new foundation in 
London, mainly set up to help the present day um, uh, victims of torture from Iraq uh, and various other countries. Eric was the first ex-Far Eastern prisoner of war because the whole point of this story really is that somebody, whether it's in the Second World War or uh, now, from people coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, etc., unless they get real help uh, immediately after they come back, and again, ongoing help, not only for themselves but their families, the trauma that these people have received um, colors the whole lives. And with Eric, um, he happened to mention during uh, one of his sessions at the Medical Foundation that he had written uh, a book or the central chapters of a book on the way back from um, India where he was sent to uh, recuperate after the um, end of the war. And it was the Medical Foundation's belief that everybody should write down their story and that initially would help them to come to terms with what had happened to them. So when the director heard that Eric had written this piece and then put it away in a drawer for the following nearly 50 years, she said, for goodness sake, get it out and let's complete it. And that is how the book came into being. Um, I think, well, we didn't expect it to be the success it, that it was because it was mainly meant to be a therapeutic exercise to begin with. And also many people write books. But the fact that Eric, although he was a human person, could rise above himself and meet this awful person so in his mind that he had been haunted by for all these years um, it really we looked upon it as being therapeutic rather than something that would be taken up with other people and the fact that he did meet his tormentor and they became very good friends genuinely uh, it surprised us both that it took off. And I'm very surprised to be sitting here in front of you people today. Mm -hmm. who, who made the first approach to adapt the book? Sir? Well, the rights were bought by a guy called Bill Kirbishley. Um, and pretty quickly he asked Andy and I to get involved and we met Eric a very, very long time ago in the Railway Museum in York, of course. And um, I don't know if you know, but this film took a really long time to make. And that has been difficult in some ways. But the plus side of that is that we, be, we became friends, haven't we? We've been part of Eric's life for a long time, for over a decade. And we've seen this story play out, or we've sort of been part of the story in some ways. Mm. Um, so it, it, it's a long time ago. And Bill Kirby bought the rights, and we've been on it since the very beginning. We've been to visit Eric lots of times, Eric and Patty at their lovely house in Berwick-on-Tweed, and yeah, we've been through a lot, actually. <laughs> I dare not ask, but then I will, anyway. Uh, anybody at this table, uh, beside you, ma'am, of course, uh, ever met any veteran from the Death Railway? Ever had a member of his family involved in the Death Railway? Um. Say almost every single one of us. You know, it's, um, it was astonishing as soon as I took on this project how many people um, would kind of approach me and approach you know, my family and things and say that their father or brother or uncle was was affected by a death railway. You know, I think it's it's funny. You know, we we were all so familiar with the great war crimes in Europe. You know, and um, the the whole Eastern story seems to be something that isn't really in our public consciousness. So, you know, this is why this film is so important. I hope it. Um, kind of helps bring it into the public knowledge a little bit more. Yeah. Colin? Uh, there was somebody around when I was growing up. He was actually a, a local 
parliamentary candidate for the Labour Party in, my, in our constituency, a man called Bill Orchin, whose name I mentioned to Eric, and he recognized it. And uh, one of the things that I knew about him was that he had been on the railway, and, um, and that he'd also in, in been involved in some sort of reconciliation. And that was really all I knew about the railway, because nothing about it was taught in, his, in our history classes at all. I uh, don't know if there's any design behind that. You can read into it what you will, but the fall of Singapore and this whole chapter is, of history, as Jeremy was saying, the, the war in the, in the East didn't feature, uh, mm. certainly in my, in my history classes, and uh, it doesn't feature in film law the way that um, you know, the European uh, wars did. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's not as much a part of the conversation. But, so Bill was, was the reference. And uh, it then turned out, I don't know how I found this out, but one of the people who helped him with his reconciliation was Nagasi. And so it, it kind of all joined up. Yeah, and that's the case in Japan as well. Uh, we don't get taught at schools. Um, so the first time I found out about it, uh, I moved to uh, London when I was 15. So I found out about this uh, POW um, sort of camps and what happened um, after I came to London. Uh, after I came to London at the age of 15. So it came as a quite a shock. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much going to be the re reaction we get from most Japanese audience as well. We just don't know it. Mm. I mean, one of the things I found, <coughs> it was not so much a number of people I knew, but once, once we I became involved in the project, in the process, and in this project, the number of people that, out of the blue, just contacted me saying that they had, you know, their father or their grandfather was was uh, on the death railway, um, and you know they 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 were almost congratulating us for trying to bring this story into the open, and uh, because it was all part, you know, it was such a shared experience of people, loved ones who had served on on the railway. Um, and been uh, captured by the Japanese there, um, but they they and had never talked about it, and that they hoped that the film in some way would uh, would uh, open the open the conversation up. Question here. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. It's uh, Bruce Kirkland from the uh, Toronto Sun, Sun Media in Canada, and this question leads from what you have all been talking about in terms of uh, education and the fact that this story is not told enough, and now you are telling it in a dramatic form, but I'm curious about the three actors uh, playing real life figures in two in cases, the same person at different ages, and what kind of pressure there is. And I know, Colin, you've done this before, and there was pressure because the royal family might have been watching through glancing eyes at something you might have done in the past. But in this case, here's Patty Lomax, it's part of the process too. So I'm curious the kind of pressure each of you felt playing a real life figure and how much responsibility there is to tell the truth as close as any film can get. Well, the, I, I, the answer to that question is implied in the way you posed the question. I mean, you, you, what you suggest is right. It, it, uh, you feel a responsibility to be as truthful as you can. Um, it's not a straightforward thing to fulfill because we don't, we're not following the facts exactly as they were. We're not observing the details exactly as they were because it's impossible. You know, as we've just been hearing, this is a story that unfolds over 50 years, 70 years now. I mean, and um, we have 90 minutes. And uh, the same thing with a film that you can do with a book and you know, you, you, you use the tools which you have, which are limited. You know, we, I haven't had any experience which is equivalent of this. As an actor, we're hired to do all kinds of different things, and, you know, perfectly often there are things you can find which correspond in your life to the experiences of a character, but there wasn't much here. And um, so you're armed with your imagination and whatever it is you can bring, and... Uh, if the characters you're playing are 
you know, if they exist, and then you form a personal relationship with them, it becomes personal, and uh, it's, it's no longer just a case of a job to be done. And particularly, you know, as you're hearing from Frank, this is a long storytelling process, and it, it began with things that Eric wrote at the end of the war that sat in a drawer, went through this period of silence, finally came out and into the light and was finished and written and published. And it's on behalf of an awful lot of people who were not able to speak out, that didn't have a voice, that still haven't been heard. And I think Eric was very conscious of writing on behalf of those people. And then it gets entrusted to you. Mm. And yes, there's, there's a huge amount of pressure. I mean, it's not necessarily the word pressure implies just perhaps just a burden. It, of course, there's pressure, uh, but there's something about being trusted, you know, which is motivating as well. You just want to be absolutely sure that you you don't drop the bat on, that you don't um, compromise how well this story has been told up to now, despite your limitations. Um, you know, that uh, such care has been taken to get the truth out there, that you don't want to do something that is fundamentally untruthful because of your own negligence or because you lack the courage or for any of those reasons. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a sense of you, one does feel privileged to be trusted. Mm. Um, so you carry that as well. But yeah, it does make it a complicated pr business. Jeremy? Um, you know, like Colin was saying, you know, my, my main hurdle here was, you know, what, what, what Eric went through to me is, is so unimaginable, you know, for someone especially of my generation and, you know, the whole idea of, of being conscripted and, 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 you know, all this kind of, you know, being sent somewhere where, where such, you know, horrific things are happening. So uh, for me, it was just fine trying to do everything I could, that anything that would just give me the slightest little glimpse into how he must have felt. So, you know, I spent... Uh, about a, I guess about just over a month beforehand, um, losing a lot of weight. Um, I lost about 30 pounds and sort of spending a lot of time on my own, just trying to find the smallest little glimmer of what it, you know, what what, what it must have felt like. Um, and of course, I didn't get anywhere close. But you know, every now and again, I'd, you know, I had a moment when we got back from a, a long day's filming in in, in Thailand looked in the mirror and I, by this point I was pretty emaciated and kind of looked myself in the mirror and went, wow, like that must have been kind of how, how you know, these guys must have looked. And, you know, every now and again you have a little moment where you kind of, kind of takes your breath away. And it was, um, you know, it was a very, it was a very emotional experience. Um, I've, I've never kind of had that sort of connection to a project before. And uh, certainly last night, watching the movie with Patty was, um, yeah, it was very emotional and it certainly, uh, you know, if we could, if we could just do a small bit of justice to the story, then um, yeah, that's wonderful. To then we'll take a question from here. Just to pick up on what you guys just said, um, it's good to be trusted and all that. But how does it translate on a day-to-day -day basis? Beforehand, did you prepare? Did you spend a lot of time with Mr. Lomax? And in case of Nicole, with Mrs. Lomax, did you? just ask question and tank in every kind of information you get and then did your own petite cuisine inside and then when they appeared on the set they would go oh is that what he came up with or she how does it work <laughs> it's a bit all of all of, of that i suppose we it's, <laughs> it's sort of a salad really of, of some of that and you know i think i think everyone including myself you know have a, has a process in which to you know, you, 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 at one point you're trying to be truthful, but you're also trying to tell a story and you're trying to make a film and you, you, in a sense you're, you're trying to allow the process to be as organic as possible, um, but also respect the larger story and, and the real people's lives that, that, that you're dealing with, but also from my point of view, respect the process and um, preparation that each of, each of the actors do and do differently to each other. And it's partly it's about giving space, but also hopefully about giving good guidance at the right time, you know, from my point of view anyway. I, do, I mean, they, those are all good questions, but they, they remain questions. Mm. <laughs> you know, how do, we do, how do you go about it? I mean, you, you snatch at anything, you forage for anything that might help. You, you, 
you try to, you know, there are systems in place. We, I went to drama school. We were taught systems and, and disciplines and ways of accessing these very uh, difficult, ne nebulous th things that we deal with. You know, it's, it's, it's illusion. It's a story, and it's full of paradoxes, you know, because it's, we're, try we're, we're trying to get the truth of something through means which are entirely false. I mean, we're not really these people. Uh, it's <laughs> fake. We're, we're making it up. Uh, you know, we're, we're building things out of paper mache and pretending to be something else. It's completely artificial. Uh, and yet we're always chasing this thing which is supposed to be true. And uh, that's... And, so, and sometimes, you know, inst your instinct just tells you, so you know, tells you something. And in a way, you've got to go with your instinct, but also... Um, you know, you, you're also bound by, you know, this, this sort of um, contrived sense of creating truth as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it, you know, it's a very fragile business making a movie and often it's, you know, it's a cliche, but what happens on the day with, that, it, that is sort of a, uh, an amalgamum of, of everything that you've gone through in the discussions, um, discussions we all had in some way contribute to, you know, what we end up putting on film, but it's not something you can just, you can analyse too closely in a way. I'm a great believer in the power of the sheer accident. Mm. Uh, I think sometimes the best things happen randomly. You didn't expect it. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you can create an environment which is conducive to the fortunate accident, you know, rather yeah, than the unfortunate. Then, then all of a sudden the real character comes in. Mrs. Lovax comes and visits the set and Nicole freaks out. Uh, well, well, yes, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's kind of, again, it's, it, it's both. I mean, to meet the people you're playing is, uh, is not only an enormous benefit and an enormous help to be, ha you know, to be handed over this responsibility and, and to sh get the benefit of what they are able to tell you. Um, it's also a stark reminder that you're not them, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but you, it's one of those things, as I said, you, you can't quite define it. We, we, we're trying to catch lightning in a bottle, and you, you know it when you see it. The question, the question over there. Who has the mic? Go ahead. Hello. Uh, it's, uh, I'm Catherine Short from The Guardian. Uh, I just wondered if you had any theories on why this particular episode in history has been slightly ignored by film and also in the curriculum. And I also, if I may, I wondered if um, seeing it visualized on the big screen gave Patty and indeed Eric, if he saw any footage, um, any new insight into the experience. Could I? Could I? Yeah, go, go. I mean, I think the reason it's, it's kind of a, a, a cumulative thing. The reason it was originally ignored is, is really simple. We won the war. We didn't want to hear stories about defeat and in fact surrender. You know, there was just not, that wasn't the right time for them. And then collectively, those men had been so traumatized, they didn't speak themselves. We often talk about how they've, they've been ignored, but they also, it's true, isn't it, Patty, didn't really want to speak out, never organized, never had a voice. And that's sort of why Eric's, that's one reason why Eric's voice is so important, you know, that he did galvanize other people to, to start speaking out. I mean, I mean, Patty, you should answer this as well, but I think one, one thing I want to say about the film is that, you know, it does, we, we, are, we are remembering the Burma campaign and all that stuff, but these are very live issues as well. This isn't just about, this isn't just about a forgotten moment in history. Tr sadly, these are very important issues now. The way that Eric was tortured was waterboarding. When we first started working on this film, that seemed like a kind of antique, remote thing and now it's part of how we do business in the West. And that's, it's like Patty's taught very eloquently about Eric's work with the Medical Institute and the other people who've been tortured as well. These are very uh, alive issues. It's not just about a forgotten moment in history. It's something that's really, really now. And I guess that answers some of the second half of your question, which is, you know, because dealing with it, you, you realise that it is a live thing. This is, you know, the, and, and it's a thing that never goes away. The oldest and greatest piece of writing about war is the Odyssey, which is about the fact that it takes you ten years to get back home from a war. You know, we've always known that nobody ever just walks back home from a war. Patty, do you want to say something about how just I'm making the film? I'm thinking. <laughs> Why are you thinking? I don't want to put words into your mouth, but I want to sort of pick up on something that you were asking, like, what's it, what's it like when Patty visits the set? 
and, and, and kind of implying that, you know, there'd be some time. When Patty and her family were on the set, it was a party. It was always wonderful, partly because you're just so fantastically generous. Yes. But also, like, I think that's a really important bit of our story because this story isn't... We, we, we were very sad that Eric died before he could see the film. Um, but we realised afterwards that the last person on earth who needed to see this film was Eric Lomax. And that the real ending of Eric Lomax's story is that he'd been through all that and been to the darkest place possible and somehow at the end of his life had this capacity to enjoy friendship and cake and to he really, really buzzed off his day on the set. Wow. He really loved his day on the set. And that, that you could rebuild yourself to that extent that you could be dealing with all this material and for it still to be fun. The, and the best day of filming was the day that uh, Papati was on the set often, but Eric was very frail. And there was one day when we shot in Berwick on Tweed at the end of your road when it should have been really easy for Eric to wander out. And in fact, that morning he was quite, he was more frail than usual. He couldn't get out. Then Colin and Nicole went to see him and he felt quite jizzed by that visit. And so he did want to come and visit the set, but we'd moved by then and we were up a hill and it was quite windblown. And, it was really awkward and all the electricians had to carry him up the hill like in his wheelchair like something from a Herzog movie. And it was just the <laughs> best. And he was just, he was so Eric. It was just brilliant. Do you remember what he asked? He, yeah. Yes, can I? Yeah, go get, I mean, Eric was obviously obsessed and fascinated by railways and you always want your heroes to be your heroes. So we got Eric settled by the monitor and the wind was blasting round and there was this huge crew there. And I said, is everything all right, Eric? He, was, he said to him, I'd be very because there were dolly tracks, it was a tracking shot, and he went, I'd be very interested to know what gauge those tracks are. <laughs> 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 so, and that's that shot still in the movie, and it will never, no matter how redundant it might ever seem, ever come out of any cut, because that's, for us, that's that talismanic day. When, when, about generosity, it wasn't, it wasn't like coming on and saying, you're not doing this right. It I don't know, I didn't mean it that way. ability to enjoy the fact that we were making a movie. Apart from the importance of it and the seriousness of it, the pure pleasure of the fact that this, and that's what you've been like these last few days as well. It's, it's been brilliant having you here. Well, thank you. I think that uh, I had every opportunity of being invited uh, to go on the set, and I was able to do so at certain times. But obviously, Eric by then was becoming very ill, and I didn't leave his side very often. But we do have family, and every one of them were invited to go to the set. They were on the set. One of my sons was there every single day. He followed the crew all the way around uh, Scotland, as well as locally. So both Eric and I were very inf kept very informed, uh, both by um, Andy Patterson and Jonathan and Frank also and our families so we although sometimes couldn't be there uh, we were very much part of it but uh, can I just make one observation they, there's another point to this film and that is that no matter how bleak life might be there's always a way forward if you're open to see it. That hanging on to old um, angers and slights and whatever life throws at you, it shouldn't stop you living. You have to let these things go one way or another. And I think really that is the legacy that my husband has left more than anything else. And it's uh, relevant to today as it was to yesterday. Sir. Um, one thing, I will applaud that too, definitely. One point that fascinates me about this film is the idea of not just forgiving your tormentor, but befriending him. Anybody have any thoughts about this? I mean, this film is based on fact. Eric Lomax is a real person. This is what he did. Anybody on the panel have any thoughts about if they were in his situation, could they not just forgive but befriend the individual who tortured them? Well, I mean, I think, I think it's a, a, you know, an interesting question and I, I, the way I sort of have always looked at it is that, you know, forgiveness is not something 
and in a way friendship isn't you know it's something that you wake up and discover you know you it's a process and you know one of the things we worked a lot on and discussed a great deal that that we had to somehow um, depict in the film a process of forgiveness or a period of time that passed to allow that to, to in a sense blossom and and the realization to, to come out of that the way I've always sort of looked at looked at it in sort of a roundabout way of answering your question is that by reconnecting with life, by reconnecting with um, those around you, by reconnecting with those base emotions, those fundamental emotions like love and intimacy and attachment and commitment and trust and those sort of things, that the, nat the natural um, state of human beings is to is to forgive, it's one of those things that define us as, as human beings. And similarly with friendship, um, that, that we, as we crave friendships and by reconnecting with, with life and with those around us, that, that, that possibly that is a natural um, extension of, of, uh, of possibly that changing state. That's, I can't analyse it too scientifically, but that's sort of how I always looked at it, is it was that it was about a, you know, the story was about a man who had experienced you know, extraordinary um, brutality and extraordinary humiliation and l l uh, had lost a huge amount of control over um, so much of what he'd done and that he was able, to, the remarkable journey back from there to a place where, in a sense, he became and rediscovered his own normality in a sense and, and as Paddy said, was able to um, go on living um, and did so for a long, long time. And it's on that note that we bring this press conference, I'm afraid, to conclusion. Our time is up, so is yours. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.